Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mailbox for the 13th of July 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is TF2 again, because I feel like playing TF2 this week. Why not? <laughs> Let's play TF2. First email comes in from Fushu that says, In the past couple of weeks, I've been noticing a reoccurring event. People who play ranked team games like Horn and Dota using the ranked game client decided that their precious points are more important than having fun and using teamwork. People in Horn will kill Steel to get more overall kill count, even if they don't really need the money and the XP in the game as much as other team members. Stealing the carry skills through last hits, for example, results in carry heroes being underfed and ultimately the entire team's loss. In Dota RGC, players place themselves in the team where the better players are. Results are one team that's full of newbies and a second team full of good players, whereas it's pretty obvious who will win. Players rather points over fun. They will choose the better team before the game start and win it without much challenge. In ranked solo games, it doesn't bother me that much, but in team games, the whole team suffers because of one greedy bugger. Note that these are only two examples out of many. Have people sunk this low when their virtual greed for points has gotten this big that they cannot be trusted to balance the teams themselves and have to have it forced on them like in Hon? Why do people find it more fun to acquire points than playing the actual game in a fair, balanced and challenging manner? Because people like Big Shiny! In fact, that's all they like. You want to see evidence of that? See how WoW has become. WoW has gotten to the point where it's an entirely reward-driven game. As in, the game actually doesn't matter anymore. It's how big the shiny is at the end. It's the only explanation I can give for people who want to do dailies over and over again. What other explanation is there? They're boring. They require no thoughts. They certainly don't have any challenge in them. They're repetitive to the point where you have to do them every bloody day. But it's okay because Big Shiny is somewhere in the distance. We're going to get our hands on Big Shiny. In this case, things like KD and points are the reason that keeps people playing. Can you explain 10th, 15th, 20th, 5,000th prestige in the latest Call of Duty title or whatever? Why? It gives you this tiny little icon. That's it. <laughs> you lose all your stuff. It's like, oh, I've got 15th prestige. I'm better than you. You've only got 13th prestige. Shut up. You are stupid. Whatever the case, achievements, I think, are a big, big part of this. Everyone's been after high score for ages, since the dawn of time in terms of video games, but achievement points have made this the most insepid nonsense ever. It's not about playing the game anymore, it's about doing things in a specifically contrived manner in order to get a badge. And to be honest, I was not into that after I stopped being 11 years old and left Boy Scouts. I mean, come on, really? Do we need merit badges for everything these days? The stupid thing about doing this in Hon is that it will actually make you lose, and that drags down your overall rating. And I have to wonder if people just have this bizarre, twisted, psychotic need to do these dumb things and then blame everyone else for their loss. I don't get it. I mean, League of Legends, Heroes of New Earth, though, to have the worst communities for any game ever. In the history of ever. Ever. They are awful. You cannot imagine how bad they are. And it's mostly the way that the game mechanics are set up that they turn people into raving lunatics. But you can't blame the game mechanics for everything, especially when people are doing the exact opposite of what the game mechanics require you to do in order to win. Surely you wish to win. I'm gonna take kills from the carry. Why would you do that? <laughs> you, do you know what the carry is? You know what the carry is there for? The carry is there to carry your team in the late game, and in order for the carry to be effective, he must get good farm. He must get plenty of kills. Stop deliberately stealing his stuff. Don't steal his last hits, for God's sake. It's a good example, actually, of, a, say, if you're playing a support hero in League of Legends, Sona is a prime example. I've seen Sona players that repeatedly steal last hits in a dual lane. And it's like, you're stealing these hits from Master Yi, or Lane Warwick, or something along those lines, or Ash, or just, indeed, any carry of any real description. Why do you need kills? You are Sona. Stop taking last hits from the other player. But it happens. It really, really does. And yeah, every now and again, sure, you'll snipe off a hero, because that's just the way of things. You know, he might have got out of range, like, hey, I can hit my Q and I can kill him. Great. That's not stealing a kill. But when you deliberately go out of your way to do it, it's dumb as bricks. And I have to wonder, whose point's more important? Apparently, some people that play Heroes of New Earth and Dota believe that KD is more important than winning and their PSR rating and their actual ladder points. In which case, please uninstall the game. You are irrevocably stupid. 
This one comes in from Bismarck. It says, It's come to my attention that many gaming commentators are starting to accuse each other of just being in it for the money. Most don't use names, but many comments seem to throw out names, and this has slowly become a common trend for the commentators to talk about in their videos. Some say these commentators are whiny, others favour them because they like their videos, etc. And then they blame other commentators for wanting money. This seems to have grown very large, as you can see a mini war raging in the video comments. Do you believe that the commentators are whiny for talking about it and complaining about it to many people who are joining the business for money? Or do you believe that the commentators are bringing light onto an important topic? People get really weird when money is involved. Really weird. I mean, here's the thing. A lot of people tend to get very aggressive around this subject because, in theory, anyone can do this. What I'm doing right now, in theory, anyone who is a gamer, who has the necessary software and very basic editing skills and a decent microphone can do this. But they aren't doing it. And sometimes that makes people mad because they maybe go to a job that they don't want. Maybe they have a life that isn't quite as cool as they want it to be. And they see people doing the things they want to do. And yes, they get jealous. Jealousy is a big, big factor. And that's just a fact. It's not even down to bragging or anything like that, saying, oh, you know, I make my living doing this and you don't. Ha ha ha. That's very rarely, if ever, expressed by anybody. It's more down to the fact that, yes, jealousy is a real thing when it comes to this particular line of work. Because it does have a very low barrier to entry. But YouTube is really a cult of personality. And the reason that some of these commentators, myself included, get very popular is because people are attracted to their personality in one way or another. Maybe it, they're a kind of love to hate kind of guy. I'm sure that a portion of my demographic likes watching my videos just to see me flail about badly in video games. That's okay, I don't really mind. There are others that share their point of view or there are others that just simply look up to them and respect them for whatever reason. And that's the only real good explanation around this. You can see things on YouTube that are, say, better than one commentator and something on the channel. It's like, oh, you know, this obviously has a lot of work put into it, and yet it's got less views than this. Why is that? Well, this is just the, the whole world works this way. This is how the media works in general, and YouTube is no particular exception to that. I have a problem with people ever bringing money into it and saying, oh, well, you're just in this for the money, because that's kind of dumb. That's like saying, oh, well, you just go to work for your money. Well, yes, you do. <laughs> The thing is that people make this distinction between jobs that they have to go to and jobs that they would like and jobs that they perhaps enjoy in one way or the other. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the world that have jobs that they actually enjoy doing. They get genuine fulfillment out of it. That's not to say that that job is 100% kittens and flying ponies and rainbows and nonsense like that. I, this job that I'm doing right now, I work long hours. I mean, I work sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day. I'll stay up till four to five in the morning to the point where I can barely see finishing editing. Video editing is not that fun. It's actually a very laborious job a lot of the time. It takes quite a bit of time to do, and it's a pain in the ass. It's not very enjoyable. And hell, even very simple things like superimposing the text on these particular mailbox videos is a bit of a pain in the ass. But at the end of the day, it's by far not the worst job you could have. I enjoy my job. But it is a job, and the reason, in my opinion, that I continue to have a very successful channel is that I treat it like one. I think there are a lot of gaming commentators that perhaps do not treat this like a job, and they just happen to be earning money off the side, and that's okay. But they can't then expect to reap big rewards out of it. You know, my income is good. There is no real question about that. I am living a comfortable life right now, but I am paying for it in terms of the amount of time that I spend on this channel. I could spend less time on the channel but I wouldn't earn as much, and I wouldn't be living as comfortably as I am. However, I could be earning a lot more. For instance, I could split this mailbox video into two videos and pre-roll ads on both of them. I could stick an ad in the middle of this video if I wanted. I have the ability to do that. Am I going to do that? No, because that seems to me entirely unreasonable. That, that to me, is money grubbing. It interrupts the viewer experience, and it actually lessens their enjoyment in return for me earning a bit extra cash. That's not fair. I think that you can get an awful lot more out of this job in the long term if you are able to build respect with the people that actually watch your stuff. In fact, when it comes to stuff like this, like the mailbox is pure opinion from me. If you guys don't at least respect my opinion in some way, then you're not going to watch it. Now, you might disagree with me. That's fine. Everyone has their own opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. But to say that, say, I'm just in this for the money is nonsense. And indeed, to accuse any commentator of that, I think, is nonsense. Because one way or the other, it is their job. Money is a factor. Money is always going to be a factor. But the nice thing about this job 
is that if you do it right, then everyone can win. Producing more content is good for you in terms of the amount of money you earn, and it's also good for the people who are watching your channel, because, hey, they get more stuff to watch. That's what they want, right? So I don't like the discussion at all. I think it is absolutely ridiculous. Your passion for what you're doing, particularly when it comes to games, your passion for gaming and the amount of money you're earning, they don't relate in any possible way. To say that I am less passionate about games now because I'm earning money from it than I was a year ago when I wasn't is nonsense. I'd say I'm more passionate about it, particularly when it comes to, say, indie games. I'm way more into indie games than I was before. I'm way more into promoting something and helping out small developers and stuff like that. I mean, to me, that seems like passion for your work, right? So it's a dumb debate. It really, really is. I don't think it's fair to say any gaming commentator is just in it for the money. If that's the only reason that you happen to be doing this job for, then I think that people will spot that. People are not dumb in that regard. They can tell if you have no passion for what you're doing. They can tell if you're just phoning it in. And they will punish you for it because there's a huge amount of competition on this market. It's very easy to just unsub from a channel and go to another channel that does a very similar thing. This one comes in from Jordan that says, I've been thinking about the PSN pass, which was recently announced by Sony. This pass is much like what many publishers are doing today, by putting a code in with the packaging of new games which are needed to access the online content of the game. Sony has stated that this PSN pass will be implemented in specific Sony first-party games from September, starting with Resistance 3. I've heard a lot of uproar about this because a lot of gamers think this is a cash grab by yet another publisher. However, I see little wrong with this. It encourages consumers to buy their games new, which in turn helps the publisher, as they make literally and figuratively nothing from used game sales. Even buying a used game, paying the price for the pass shouldn't be that huge of a deal anyways. It's probably only about five euros or five pounds, and most used games are half price or less after a few months. Seeing as PSN is free, I think it's fine that Sony is doing this. So I was wondering, what do you think about that PSN pass and similar schemes by publishers? In this case, I think it's totally fine. I mean, we all know that used game sales do take money away that might, and I say might, have otherwise been given directly to the publishers and the developers. Now, of course, a big chunk of that goes to the retailers, the distributors, and things like that, but still... Yes, money goes to the publisher and developer if you buy a new game, not if you buy a used game. And I might point out that a lot of companies, including GameStop in the US and Game in the UK, aggressively push used games to the point where they actually put used copies of the games on the shelf next to the new one and will actively ask you at the checkout, would you like to buy this used for cheaper? And more often than not, people will say, yeah, sure. At which point, you have just actively screwed a publisher and a developer out of a sale. Actively. You have gone out of your way to aggressively do that. You haven't done this passively by just leaving it on a shelf. Someone has come up with a new game and said, I want this game. And they've turned around and said, how about this one? It's just the same, only it's a little bit cheaper. And they turn around and say, yeah, sure. So that sale that was going to happen, 99.9% .9 certain sale, has now suddenly disappeared. Those kind of tactics are the reason that publishers are having to resort to this. I might point out this is not the only thing. When it comes to PSN Pass, we're not only talking about lost sale, we're talking about additional costs accrued by someone that hasn't paid the cover charge. The cover charge being that you purchase the game. And if you purchase the game when it comes to PSN, you also purchase the ability to play that game online. And of course, there are additional services required to make that happen. More often than not, you'll have servers running, even if it's just for login. Paying, you are paying for the upkeep of PSN. That is why PSN is free. That's what pays for it. And if you buy nothing but used games, then you are using a service that you basically have not paid to help out with. And you're not expressly being asked to, which is a fair point. But you are costing Sony money. So why should Sony not try and recoup in this regard? It's not a cash grab at all. Not in any way, shape or form is it a cash grab. It does not affect people that buy new games in any way, shape or form. None. Not at all. So there you go. I'm okay with it. I'm totally fine with it. It seems reasonable to me. If I buy a used game, then should I really expect it to be of exactly the same quality? Physically, yes. Maybe it's got a scratch or two on the disc, but it still runs just like a normal one. But should I 
feel that I am entitled to, say, the online play of a game that I bought used? Probably not, no. I don't find that to be reasonable. I think it's okay to have this kind of inclusion. There are arguments in favor of used games. Don't get me wrong. The idea that because you can trade in games and actually get some of the money back, you are able to then purchase more new titles. But there's really nothing to prove that that money is then going into new titles, not just into an another used game. Yes, there are only a limited number of used games on the market, so you can't have everyone just turn around and buy it used. Someone's got to buy it new initially. But I think that argument is a little bit threadbare, honestly, in favor of used games. That said... I would argue in favor of used games sometimes simply because more often than not you get games that come out without reasonable demos and it seems to me that publishers and developers need to actually extend an olive branch to players. I mean, for one thing, the idea of getting a PSN pass, does this benefit you in any way? I mean, it just gives you something that you would have already been able to do anyway on an older title. Why can't this PSN pass include something extra? You know. I think that incentivizing the purchase of new games is a good idea. I don't necessarily think that punishing people that don't buy new games is a particularly good idea. It's not a way to get consumers on your side. And I think consumer goodwill is a very powerful tool and a currency that should not be thrown away so idly and so lightly. When it comes to games in general, publishers must understand that games are kind of expensive and as a direct result they should be doing everything they possibly can to make consumers believe that they are making a safe and sound purchase that is of course by releasing demos and by releasing honest marketing materials and of course most importantly by releasing good games with actual longevity not to mention as bug free as humanly possible i might add releasing broken games is a horrible idea and i think that's partly the reason why people buy used, because they're not willing to risk the full amount on a title like that. And yes, if you wait a couple of months, you can pick something up used significantly cheaper than the new version. It is a little bit of give and take on both sides. I think that a lot more people would be willing to buy new games if they were sufficiently rewarded for doing so, and if they believed that the publishers and developers were actually going out of their way to produce a high-quality product. And I think a lot of trust and indeed love has been lost between both sides over the past few years after various scandals and disappointing releases. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox. Email in mailbox at cynicalbread.com with topics for future shows. I'll see you next time. Victory.